Do you want to pass SEB and not sure about your preparation? What if you could learn the strategies that top scorers are using to pass the SE exam? Hi, my name is Dr. Owen Kwan. I've had hundreds of GB trainees pass SE with confidence. In this video, I have a chat with a GB trainee who failed the SE exam with score 70.5. He was completely devastated, but he went on to smash the exam with score of 100.5. We dive deep into his preparation, what exactly he did differently the second time. This is a video you don't want to miss if you're planning to sit the SE exam. Let's dive right into it. Hi Abbas, how are you doing? Hi, thank you Evan, I'm doing well um, and it's really good to see you again um, on, you know, seeing you from the other side now, which is lovely. Tell us about your background. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm I'm a GP trainee in the Northeast um, and I initially sat the, um, the SA exam in March um, and unfortunately um, I was short back then, you know, and um, so that was really quite difficult, not not just not having passed the exam back in March, but leading up to the exam was very quite mentally challenging. The the revision process to for the exam itself was very challenging. Um, ultimately, it probably wasn't the right time to sit the exam, given the circumstances in my personal life at the time as well. Um, and I think I was not really able to get on top of the anxiety um, you know, I was having nightmares before on the night of the exam and wasn't able to sleep. So I went into the March exam with very little sleep. Um, and ultimately that did cost me because, you know, I was missing key information, uh, for instance, not reading the full vignette in, in a couple of the cases and perhaps missing cues because I wasn't fully there. Um, so, so having had failed the exam in March, it, it was quite shattering actually um and i didn't expect that before the exam because the part of me felt okay even if i fail it will be a learning process and i'll come out of it and i'll you know learn from it but failing the saa was very hard um if if i'm entirely honest it, it completely broke my confidence I, I think um more so um you know i wasn't really um I, I, whether as a result or whether because i wasn't ready to sit in the first place you know, um, probably a multitude of factors, but seeing patients on a day to day was quite difficult to do, uh, you know, and um, I had a chat to my ES as well um, and, uh, you know, explained and we had a chat about this at the time um, and he was very supportive, which, which was fantastic. So over time, once I kind of um, got through that phase um, and then um, then I kind of looked forward as to what I have to do differently, what I didn't do before, because I felt like I did work really hard back then as well. So um, it was just planning and seeing, you know, what I to, to do things that I didn't do before. Um, so that kind of led me to lots of different resources. Um, uh, so initially, you know, I used uh, generally a very good, you know, resource um, in, you know, a lot of people may have heard about it in uh, Nigel Giam, um, which I found very helpful. Um, I used other resources as well, like SCA revision and lots of lots and lots of group practice. Um, and then uh, I think I was still sort of struggling in my day to day. So then I thought, you know, I need to invest a bit more in myself um, and, and try and, uh, you know, the ultimate aim shouldn't really just be the SCA. So I was trying to change that mindset and 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 trying to feel actually uh, it's not really about it is about the SEA but it's also about day to day practice and I felt like I needed a little bit more coaching um, and so, so then I was kind of looking for other options as well um, to kind of supplement everything else as well so then I came across obviously your 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 platform um, and it, it seems like a long time ago now but we we had the initial meeting. Um, and I was very anxious. I was very low in confidence, uh, as you know. Um, and exam was now at that point reserved for September, um, and I was keen to sit it, but I was in two minds throughout. Um, so I think we had that chat, and then we talked about, you know, some ways we can move forward. And then I was talked about the, uh, the the blueprint, um, which which I I enjoyed using because um, you know we can talk about. Some of that later, I suppose, but but basically, I think because I was so mentally um, low at that time, and 
finding it difficult to pick myself up properly. I felt, you know, all these resources, resources combined. But I think when I spoke to you, it, it felt like, um, okay, now I think um, once I get the blueprint um, up and running, then it almost gave me like a content page to work with because I couldn't, the other thing was I couldn't structure my revision very much. Um, so whilst um, some of the resources were great, uh, it was just I wasn't able to mentally structure my revision. And I think the blueprint really helped with that structure. What exactly did you do differently to structure it then? So in, in the blueprint, obviously, there was uh, lots of different videos, but there was also, uh, uh, which I think was very helpful, the Excel sheet. And I think the Excel sheet was uh, for people who don't know what I'm talking about. It's like um, it basically it's like reflections, but more focused on on um, picking up um, key bits from consultations, either recorded or what you know done with colleagues, with real life, and including the exam that we've sat um, to just reflect a bit more in and try and figure out what went wrong and what could be done better. A uh, very specific point. So. That was very helpful. And then also there was the masterclass and, and th that was involving more challenging cases um, to to kind of expose areas of weaknesses. Um, so I think using using the Excel sheet, using the kind of going through the blueprint um, chapter by chapter sort of gave some sort of um, a content page in that sense where I was able to then time my revision a bit better, um, uh, you know, on a day to day. Uh, uh, and also, uh, I think that that was quite helpful to me um, because at the end of the day, I could go back to the Excel sheet, put things in, and actually look back at it and say, well, actually, I had, you know, it might, it, it, I've done quite a lot today, actually. And, you know, it gave me that confidence and self belief that actually, slowly but steadily I'm, I, I, I might just get there. So you were keeping track of your progress and reflecting mm -hmm. on your consultation, you could come back to it rather than just doing cases without mm. completing the learning cycle. Yeah, well summarized, I think. How did you go about study sessions and how did you plan it? I was trying to kind of find the balance for myself as, as to what, what kind of flowed okay in my consultation. So it was a bit of trial and error mistakes were made, obviously, uh, in that journey, in the process. Um, but some areas I found, okay, well, you know, actually, this really works well for me. And I, I think I need to stick with that and, and this sort of um, strategy. And then there were some areas which uh, I think uh, I picked up from from yourself and uh, actually which was really helpful um, and ultimately helped in the exam as well. A lot of delegation, for instance, were appropriate. Where so that kind of mindset, I have to deal with everything in the six minutes of management, um, was quite difficult to get away from. Uh, so I think in the exam, I delegated quite a lot, um, and um, so I, you know, using uh, stock phrases, you know, I would recommend, um, you know, trying to address the concerns early in the in the in the management, which was uh, which was generally a common theme in in, in the courses I've been to. Um, but reinforcing that every time, um, which which was which was helpful. So I think, you know, all of that helped me frame my day to day consultations slowly but steadily. You know, helped me um, apply that in the day to day consultations, which was which is one of my personal aims for myself that I wanted to kind of achieve from the, the course. When you say delegation, what do you mean by that? For instance, um, before what I was doing um, was uh, if someone needed lifestyle advice, I would go into quite a lot of detail in that. Like, for instance, you know, you, you could do uh, um, and, and actually start to go through the lifestyle advice and go back and forth and patients would say, you know, well, I can't do that. I can't do this and things like that. So um, ultimately it wouldn't lead to anything. And then I wouldn't have time to talk more about medications or set a kind of, a, um, you know, what what we could do next. I wouldn't have time to complete the consultation. Um, so I, I, I found that, you know, actually delegating what I can, for instance, lifestyle, talk very briefly about it. You know, this is what we generally recommend, it, um, you know, be insightful into the psychosocial background you know if you find that actually it's going to be difficult for them to achieve the 150 minutes of exercise a week or, or something then then just talk about what we recommend but you can see that's difficult is it okay if i you know get the practice nurse or social prescriber with specialist interest in weight loss or whatever to kind of get in touch with you to discuss that in more detail to that's help great. 
Yeah, so I think that was really helpful because I did apply that in the exam and it, it wasn't my natural way. So it was hard for me to do that. And coming out of the exam, I felt I don't know if I did the right thing or not. Um, but having seen my breakdown now, it obviously worked because the uh, in the IPS I scored very highly. Um, it was the best out of the three domains and all of this sort of comes under IPS and how you negotiate these things. Tell us about your score then, Obas, because um, you smashed <laughs> the second city. Yeah, um, and, you know, I refreshed the screen many times to to make sure that wasn't a dream. <laughs> and, and and the first thing I did in the morning was just to check it again in case they've taken it back or something. But no, I, it was it was um, a shock for me because I, I scored 70.5 in March and I scored 100.5 in this setting. Um, and they hadn't given the breakdown until just later, this just a couple of hours ago. So just haven't gone through the breakdown itself. Um, so the IPS has scored about 34 out of 36. Um, so I think, um, so there were lots of clear passes in there. And I'm trying to, I was trying really hard just before this, uh, you know, this um, our chat to try and figure out what was different from March. Um, so it's and I couldn't really pinpoint anything, but it's probably all those micro skills that you pick up in in courses and in your day to day practice. It's all those sort of what you can do, what we can do kind of thing. Um, you know, having a shared management plan, which is part of management, also IPS because IPS obviously runs in between, weaves in between data gathering and and management. Um, but also some of this delegation, I suspect, comes comes into that and. Um, so I think just just things like that. I mean, I, I can't probably fully explain the, the results, but but that's probably the best way I can put it. It's if you do enough of it, even if if you do enough of it with a bit of concentrated effort, it will, will probably show in, in some way or form. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's break down the three domains then. Data gathering. Mm. How did you um, structure your consultation when you started? I remember yeah. in the first yeah. sitting, there were some issues with yes. the case priming. So what did you do differently? I think what I did uh, differently was take all your advices on board, basically, and um, and really try to prime and figure out what the patient might be coming in with, what might be the underlying agenda whilst doing the priming. Um, the three minutes flew by in the exam. So, you know, there was a lot of reading to do and a little bit of thinking, strategizing what might you, you know, might want to be doing. Um, uh, for, for instance, um, you know, if, if it's a results giving case, how just thinking in your head, how you would give an explanation um, and, uh, and you know, given, going into the results um, with confidence as a result and being able to do that um, and, and then kind of going back to the data gathering part and how how you would do that and trying to keep it a focused history rather than a kind of everything um so that was something i worked very very hard on before the exam so data gathering was something i worked the hardest on um and it i think the, the, the partly the reason was because if you don't have the data gathered properly or you haven't got the underlying problem, no matter what you manage, you, you know, you could easily fail because you haven't picked out the underlying issue. Um, so that strategy worked very well in the exam because, uh, you know, um, instead of going for an all all round approach of asking every question under the sun, it was more um, question was narrowed to the concerns of the patient. And, and over time, I think I kept I, I did manage to find a structure that worked for me. So I would go into the focused history early, then I would go to, to, into the sort of ice and then use the ice to then narrow down my, um, the, you know, the meat of the history um, alongside the red flags and then like PSO and and then address the management, uh, you know, give the diagnosis, address the management and things. So it, it, the kind of structure just eventually started to then make sense to me. Whereas, you know, that was a real challenge um uh, before i think especially when i sat it in march have you found the insights in this video useful so far if so you might be interested in SEA blueprint just click the link down the description below and sign up and you will get a teaching from me every day for the next seven days having a clear structure is so important when you structured the cases beforehand and, and went into it what were your thoughts about asking red flags because sometimes people mm. feel should i ask all the red flags and sometimes yeah. you overthink yeah um if, if i'm honest with you i was a bit 
bit of a coward in the exam and I, and I kind of did ask a bit more red flags than I probably needed to. Um, and that's just because I felt like, you know, if, um, I I didn't really want to miss anything given my experience of the previous exam where I probably um, didn't do uh, where, where, where there was a case where I missed a red flag, I think. And I and I think I think that fear, you know, just doesn't go away. And so in a lot of the cases, my red flag history was quite detailed, um, but it was slicker. So it wasn't taking time, you know, so I didn't manage it very quickly. Um, uh, and so it did, yeah, so it didn't waste a lot of time. Yes, one thing that did happen was in, in a few cases that I did go way past the six minute in, in data gathering. Um, but seeing the results today, um, I did get clear passes for, for those cases in the data gathering and the IPS, but just the pass for management. So it's a, I guess it's about what you're willing to sacrifice, because if I didn't do that, I might have had enough time to do better in management and get clear pass in management, um, but it might have costed me um, clear pass in data gathering, for instance. So it's a balance, I think, um, which you which you need to make and, and trust yourself in. Now, let's go into the clinical management. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit already about how you were using your team and, and uh, delegating some of the tasks. Yeah. Tell us what uh, changed for you when, when you went into structuring your management. Management was quite hard in the exam for me. Um, you know, it, it, despite constant reminders and efforts and because when you're under exam stress and and you know the the the, uh, the uh, you know the connection's not working and you're getting blips and you're being asked to go and get a laptop in the middle of the exam to to find a laptop because it's not working and it, it, the adrenaline rush is it's crazy high and 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 what that ends up doing is that you almost revert back to your bad habits and I think I found in the exam, um, I think if I didn't practice the way I did, it would have been a complete disaster. But because I had practiced enough and I had that kind of um, almost disciplining through, throughout, it was like, uh, whilst in some cases the structure went out, did go out the window in the management. So, for instance, in some cases I forgot, forgot to give a diagnosis. You know, I went straight into management with these are the options and without actually having given a diagnosis. But I did remember eventually because it was kind of somewhere in the brain, isn't it? And it just come kind of, kind of um, something triggered. It. I was like, I'm, and I went back and I said, no, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't actually give you a diagnosis. You know, I suspect you have something called so and so and so. Um, uh, and this is how we can manage it. And and in the case that happened, I did get clear pass in the interpersonal and and the data gathering. Um, I, so I think the management structure for me, I did have to break it sometimes because then I had to say, I'm sorry, I haven't asked you this question. Can I, is it okay if I just ask you that? Or I'm sorry, I didn't give you the diagnosis. Can I just give you? So I just I just do that and, and ask what I needed to or say what I needed to, um, which, um, which meant that, you know, whilst the management structure wasn't always perfect, it still gave me enough to pass and get clear passes in other domains. You know, it might have cost me clear pass in the management, but um, you know, it, as long as you're getting clear pass in one of the domains, it's it's, it's positive. What do you think is a difference for you in terms of clear pass pass? Yeah, this is uh, again a very difficult thing to analyze. I think um, to me, in a couple of the cases, I got clear passes in management, um, and having. And I was just trying to analyze why that's happened. And uh, and reflecting back to those two cases, I think it was where I actually followed the structure really well. So I gave the diagnosis. I, I addressed their concern that I think this is, you know, I know you were thinking this is so and so, but actually um, you would expect this and this symptom. I, I suspect you have something called this um, because you have so and so symptom. And then I would go straight into what are your thoughts about that? And they would invariably say, yeah, fine. Okay, well, what, what are we going to do next? And then I would, in, in those two cases, I maintain that structure, the things you can do, the things we can do, one of the things, and I focus a lot on like other lifestyle factors. So like things you could do is, um, and then focused on, you know, gave them a few options, went through a few options, um, gave them time to clarify, and then go into the medical management. Um, and then sort of giving health promotion where needed, like cure risk or, or and things like that, and then and then safety netting, and and I found that actually where I've done all those things, um, that worked. It, that's probably what gave me the clear pass in those cases. 
on the other hand, the cases, so I, I, um, I passed majority of the other cases with, with just uh, with, with a pass. I think I failed one clinical management where where basically safeguarding referral was needed. Um, and it was, but the other cases I passed because I didn't exactly follow that structure um, for various reasons. I mean, in, a, in maybe one or two I did. So I don't know why I didn't get clear pass on those ones because I thought I did do most things. So it's difficult. I think, you know, it's a bit of luck, I, I would say, as to who's also marking your exam as well. So it's not all, um, it, it, you know, it's not all about what we can do uh, in the exam and on the day. But equally, I think if you follow the structure, you're more likely to get it. Yeah, structure is very important. When you nail down that structure, even if you're not sure about something, you can still progress it. So let's talk about uncertainty. There is a lot of uncertainty in the exam. How yeah. did you approach that? There is a lot of uncertainty, yeah. Um, so there's um, uncertainty in the sense the cases you get and how you deal with them. There's uncertainty in the sense about, you know, self-belief at times. So there's there's different, you know, uncertainty in different layers, you know. Um, but if you're talking about the uncertainty in dealing with the clinical cases itself and what we get, then I think I just dealt it by just being really honest in the exam, um, you know, there, there was a couple of cases where the patient said, ask, ask questions. Um, and uh, it, you know, because um, I, even though it was not much, it was not um, something that I knew a lot about, I tried to keep my structure to get my history data gathering and data gathering is all about following cues as much as possible, picking up cues and obviously, but in the management, you can really, um, command structure, even though in data gathering, it's sometimes difficult because you're just following the patient. So in those cases, um, I tried to keep a structure and I, and I said clearly, look, I'm sorry, I don't know much about this. Um, I, uh, is it okay if I get in touch with certain, so or send an advice and guidance, for instance, or discuss this in a clinical meeting um, and read more about it and get back to you in, in, a, in a week uh, once I have that information. Um, and I, that, that felt quite liberating because I think I would have been quite afraid to do that before in the exam. But uh, I think I was confident enough in this exam to do that in, in two cases at least. Um, and actually, just in hindsight, I got clear passes in the IPS in those cases, um, but I might have passed in the management. So I would say if it's something that you're not sure about, like a surgical procedure, side effects of it, it's not... It's not, we're not experts in that. So it's, it's you know, to deal with that sort of uncertainty, it's probably just best to say that you're not sure, but you will seek appropriate advice and you will read up about it or discuss it in a clinical meeting in the practice, whatever works for you or whatever is more appropriate for, for you in the practice. Just, just do that um, to manage uncertainty. If it's uncertainty related to something more serious, uh, like a, um, like, you know, you're thinking it's a cancer or you're thinking it's something more serious that needs urgent admission, then just basically do what you would do in, in real life. You know, if you're, if you're not sending them to hospital, give appropriate management, just safety net hard, because in that case will be mostly about safety netting. So give your time. You know, I, I, I didn't have any much, like, I didn't have a lot of cases where I had to do that um, in the exam. But if I did, I would try and get through uh, the management and and spend a lot of time on safety netting um to you know symptoms to look out for and things like that to manage the uncertainty um so and often patients help you in this exam so if, if you say i'm going to refer you urgently they might say well actually why because you know i don't think i'm not so worried about this and, and they might be right so if they do that in the exam it's probably worth re-challenging yourself and actually just pausing and thinking for a bit are you moving in the right direction um, is the patient trying to give you a cue here and and then and then reassess and re and change the direction if needed to say and actually you're absolutely right you know you're right you, um, I, I must uh, you know you, you didn't have that symptom or you had that symptom you're absolutely correct um uh, you know given that we can go down this route or that route so I, I think yeah manage uncertainty you sometimes patients will help you and they did in a few cases by asking questions um, so stay attentive for questions. So uh, that's how I think managing uncertainty 
in different kind of cases would be would be the best thing to do staying calm is very really important because this yeah. is when starting managing uncertainty goes wrong if you're anxious and feel like you have mm. to know everything but yeah in general practice it's very normal to have uncertainty and you're dealing with that every day already it leaves a very sour feeling in the sense like you know when you come out of the exam it's like i didn't know this and i didn't answer this question so like throughout the four weeks five weeks i was thinking i you know i must have failed that case so um i must have not done that properly uh, I, I didn't i did four of these things i didn't do two of these things i must have failed and you know the thoughts come back in your mind your own self-defeating thoughts you know like um uh, it's, so it's just um before the exam I, I had prepared myself to fail right before the results came out because I was like you know I, I made too many mistakes um, um uh, so it's 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 genuinely very difficult I think it's not just dealing with uncertainty in the case it's actually dealing with how you've done in the uncertainty for four weeks um this you know there's a lot of uncertainty it's basically yeah absolutely yeah so tell us about the way that you use feedback and apply it to implement it in your consultation others yeah um so first of all uh, the using the feedback my aim was to cut down the consultation times because i was taking quite a long time to to do the consultations and it wasn't purely because um you know i would uh, I, I i feel like i'm a person who, who likes to listen to my patients and try and advocate for them so i would try and deal with three or four problems at once which which actually is not a good approach for the exam and probably not a good approach for day-to-day -day practice so i think um agenda setting was quite high up in 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 um, my day-to-day -day. so i was trying to you know just make sure i've got the agenda correctly what is the underlying reason the patient's there if there's lots of things what would be you know the one thing that the patient would want me to resolve in the day if they could choose um or if there's something more urgent i would go for that obviously so but but the the feedback um, because obviously exam was the purpose but because I was also focusing on improving my day-to-day -day consultation which I was struggling with um so I was really taking back that feed, all that feedback trying to get the focused history in um and then getting the ice early in the consultations and following that structure basically trying to do that again and again it wouldn't happen in real life it wouldn't you know I think a lot of people would find that they'll do, try and do that and it won't work with every patient and that's quite disheartening but it will probably work with 50 60 percent in real life you know if you're seeing 18 patients a day 20 patients a day it'll probably work with about nine or ten patients um so you just got to persist with it and try and try and you, you just have belief in that in a system you know um and, and i think that that does help in your day-to-day -day. eventually um it becomes more natural so you can think of other things you can pick up the cues better eventually and things so I think that's one thing that's helped with the feedback. One occasion when we're doing a case in the immersive workshop that you attended and there was yeah. a negotiation case. Yeah. So tell us a lot about how did you develop your skills at negotiation? So negotiation was a very, it still is um, a difficult thing for me because I find it hard to say no. Um, so to say no, um, so I couldn't, I think I was at the point where I couldn't say no, but then when I kind of had the ability to say no a bit, then it was like I came in the mindset in the consultation that I'm going to say no. Like, you know, for instance, a patient wants Zopiclone or something, I, I, I would approach it with, I'm not going to give Zopiclone. Um, so what that does was just shut down that consultation immediately because, because you know, whatever the patient's saying, I'm not really then listening, uh, uh, you know, and I'm just thinking, okay, at the end of the day, I'm just going to say no to Zopi Kuna and say, well, this is sleep diary, you know, sleep hygiene, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and, and that was making it quite a doctor-centered approach. Um, so I think it took a lot of effort and, uh, you know, um, Nigel put in a lot of effort, chat bagging, you put in a lot of effort on that side of things because it's something... That I wasn't very good at and probably I'm better at, but still would like to be better at. Um, so I think the way I approach kind of negotiation now is just make sure you have an open mind. Um, it's not a yes or no, or definitely, uh, it's not, it's not about that. It's about, you know, listening to the patient. Why do they want that Zopiclone or why do they want a referral, um, you know, for their acne? What is the underlying issue? And once you've honed down the underlying issue, 
then to be very honest with the patient, look, I'm sorry, I can't give you, if you're not giving the Zafiqlam, then then say that. Because what, the other thing I did was I wasn't I was trying to not say no. So I was, you know, not saying I'm not going to give you the Zafiqlam, but just skirting around the issue and saying, well, we could do this and do that. And the patient would be like, yeah, yeah, but what about the Zafiqlam? Um, so I think whatever you decide, say, verbalize it, give the patient an opportunity to respond. Because, you know, they might may come up with a reasonable argument. And again, keep an open mind. Um, so that's the way I kind of try and approach things now. So if it is saying no, it's saying no and giving a reason for that. Um, if saying yes, make sure it's very clear that it's very short term. And actually, there's lots of other things you can do. So you can try and get on the same page early on in the management and then actually be able to discuss other things. So I think those were the kind of um you know feedback and things that, that I got and I, and I and it kind of stayed with me I didn't have a lot of negotiation in this exam um other than a couple of cases um but I think it came across um it, it didn't feel that difficult because obviously I, I practiced for you know harder harder negotiations like you know Zopi clone and things like that so when it came to simpler stuff it was actually quite quite um, easy to manage. With negotiation, it's very important to let the patient know that um, they've been heard and you understand yeah. the perspective. And it's really important when you find a common ground so that you're working on the same side as a patient trying to achieve yeah. a shared goal. And that way, usually it unlocks things. So it's good that um, you've learned so much and you develop your skill. Um, tell us about uh, when you look back now, um, Looking at yeah. all the preparation you've done, the resources, and there's quite a lot of things that you've gone through. If you had yeah. to give yourself a um, piece of advice, as in what would you do um, so that uh, you would have made the process less stressful, tell us what would you say to yourself? Um, the, the the process and the journey was um, was very stressful, um, you know, and. Um, I, I think I'd probably just like to, it's not just stressful for me, but it's just, it's stressful for the whole, whole family you live with, basically, because, you know, everybody has to sacrifice a little bit. Um, so you, I think, you know, if you, you need to have the right support if you're sitting this exam, you need to have the right set of colleagues, you know, right mentors. Um, that helps the process um you know uh, and I, I i you know the colleagues who haven't made it i really you know I, i'm gutted for them because you know whilst i have there's still a part of me that hasn't because you know the colleagues you've practiced with if they haven't made it so i think i think you know um if you get peer support from people who have passed and you, you know i i feel like if i if i had a lot more of that that would have been quite helpful um so i would actively seek out support if I if I could go back in time because I think you know those who did reach out and help did what well, you know did provide um a lot of moral support and the other thing would be um I think self-doubt is a really difficult thing to deal with um and you know in turn it kind of leads you to a vicious cycle that you, that, that can't do kind of attitude as is really hard. Um, it's really hard to overcome, I think. Um, so I would, and in hindsight, just looking back, obviously persistence, um, just pushing at it, you, you probably have good days and bad days in practice. You know, often I felt, why am I struggling? I've done this a lot now. And you know, why, why aren't I there? You know, why can't I just get it? Um, but it's, it's not really about that. It's about you know, actually doing it enough time, um, doing it enough so it then starts to flow naturally um, rather, rather than having to think about it too much. And I think nothing can replace good practice, good colleagues, good mentorship um, and good support all around. And so, you, so I would say, you know, try and find the right kind of formula that works. Um, and for me, you know, these are the kind of things that have worked. Um, and yeah, I, I I would I would say that I think obviously 
courses and things that, um, you know, as your course, the Blueprint and um, other courses I've, I've attended, they're, they're all very good, but it ultimately it does come down to practicing what you get feedback on. And the other thing would be not to be hurt by feedback, because sometimes feedback can be quite hard. Um, and it, it can be quite depressing sometimes, you, you know, not, not that is bad feedback, but it's just that self-reflection that, um, you know, why you, you, why can't you just do it? It's like, you know, um, why, why did you forget this question? How can you forget this red flag even now <laughs> after months of practicing or, or why can't you just get address someone's eyes? Like you've been told like, you know, dozens of times, but it's still not managing to do it. So it's just getting rid of that. It's going to happen in the journey. And it, it's just, it just keep at it. The persistence is the most important thing. Um, hard work, having the support, um, and somehow overcoming that self-doubt, um, which underpins everything. Um, so you can actually, you know, sleep on the night before um, and, you know, wake up and then have a can-do attitude. Yeah, you can do it. Um, and all of that kind of feeds into how you perform on the day. It is a whole package. You need to be able to look after your well-being. Um, sleeping well before is very really important. Otherwise, your yeah. working memory might not be on point. Yeah. This is where you're not paying attention to these cues. So yeah, I think yeah. it's good that you've mentioned all of this. Now, um, if we had to say, what are the top tips for somebody who mm. is going to sit the exam right now feeling quite anxious? How would they grow their confidence, Herbert? I think a couple of things. Just make sure that your your um Make sure the exam date you've chosen is the right day, first of all. And I, I think this is my biggest lesson. Having sat the exam in, in March, I was keen to get out the way of several reasons for that. Um, you know, I, I thought I was, you know, when I booked it, I thought I, I would be ready by the time. Um, and, you know, I wasn't. And, and, and the thing is, you need to, you need to be clear in your mind that you have a can-do attitude before the exam. You know, if you're thinking you can't do it, then the chances are you, you, you know, there are going to be mistakes you make and it's going to show. Um, you just, the lack of confidence shows. Um, the experts who mark the exam, they have the ability to pick up that low confidence. Um, they, they can pick up those vibes, I imagine, because they, they experienced that doing so um so choose you know making sure that you you choose the right date for the exam and if it's too early even if you're going to lose half the money for the for the exam it's better than sitting it and failing because failing is very difficult so if you're sitting it for the first time make sure that's very clear and you know take your cs advice cs advice and um uh, you know and, and people like yourself Erwin, and you know to 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 uh, make that decision and if if you feel like yeah you've done enough and things then the next then the steps or all the other things would start to apply and i think uh, you know um make sure you choose the right partners to practice with uh, you know you have a good working relationship with your partner um, because you're going to be pretty much a married, um, you know, for for, the, for a couple of months you're practicing, you know, you're going to be seeing your partner who you're practicing with far more than you would be seeing your family members, um, you know. So you, you need to have a good working relationship with them. There needs to be, you know, critical, good critical feedback, insightful feedback, um, uh, you know, and and just picking out on the bad habits um you know for, for instance you're forgetting to address size make sure you say that every time and, and be very hard on that um and uh, you know which as, as as a colleague i found really difficult to do with, with my colleagues but eventually i felt like actually by not doing it you're doing a bit of injustice and the other thing would be um if you are doing a course then um you know use it as as stamp points almost so like you know, the first session, it might, you're going to make mistakes, no matter how much you practice, because obviously there's an, ex, it's an expert opinion and you're going to get um, fed back. You're basically getting what you, you paid for because you, you, you know, you, 
you're going to get feedback which is appropriate for you to help you improve um and you might not have um any idea of what that is or, and your colleague might not know so once you get that then to then try and routinely practice that in your day to day with your colleagues and and have a paper in front of you if you need be to you know in the initial stage especially that's fine um you know if you you're struggling with structure have something in front of you at the practice stage and eventually kind of not have it and so you can practice without papers and things but find a way to uh, get rid of bad habits and in, introduce new habits every single day you know day by day you know little steps um you give yourself a good few you know two three months i would say uh and you keep assessing are you still fit to sit this exam um because if there's something else going on in your life if you're not mentally ready if there are personal issues in your life which i did at that back back at that time you know so i think it's really difficult to sit this exam because you you, you know just to try and make sure all those things are in order absolutely yeah, yeah. i think you've covered a lot of practical tips here so somebody who's listened up until now who are considering like they might go for coaching um but they're not mm. sure um because the thing is you were quite I'm keen in investing in yourself. Somebody might think about the financial yeah. um, consideration. What would you say to that person, Herbert? I think, um, yeah, there's no doubt financial considerations are, are going to be coming in. And I think um, the way I looked at it was it's, it's more it's more than just practicing for the exam. And I think if you think of it in a way that, you know, what are you doing this exam for? Um, are you doing it to just pass CSEA or are you practicing and doing it to become a good competent GP who can actually do very good day-to-day -day consultation, do justice with their patients, you know, you can advocate for your patients appropriately and do it all within a certain time frame. Um, then think of it in a way you're investing in your self-development. You know, you can think of all the courses people might do, diplomas and things. Um, so, you know, in a way you're just doing a course, which is um, you, you're investing in yourself, investing in important communication skills. And whatever whatever course you choose, like, you, you know, just, just think of it that way. It's not just for the SEA exam. It's it's for your personal self, it's for, you know, personal confidence, it's for your personal day-to-day um, -day practice. Um, and and not just that, you know, it goes beyond that. It goes on your day-to-day -day life as well. You know, you, you, you have to negotiate things in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so the skills there for, it's not just medical application, you know, the, the, these negotiation skills in the blueprint and or any of the course that you would do. You know, but I, I found I think in your in your blueprint there was something about smart and in, in negotiation, and you you have a whole kind of um, uh, uh, you know uh, webinar. On. I did see that, and um, you know I might not have time to apply that very much, but actually, you know, you, you get skills where where would, that would help you in, overall anyway. So yeah, you know, think about finances. Um, think about you know what what you're in what you're actually investing in um and if you feel those two goals align then then it's you know i think that would help clear a lot of things in your mind are you feeling anxious about the SCA preparation maybe you're not getting constructive feedback you don't know whether you're doing the right thing if you're looking for one-to-one -one support i'd love to help you click the link down in the description below to book a call with me to see how I can help you to pass your exam. It's good to see the progress and, and the journey, um, the highs and the lows. Um, yeah. and, and now you're due to CCT in April, I understand, right. right? So yeah. what's your plan looking forward then, Herbert? Yeah, plan looking forward, I because I've been so invested in in, in you know in this sort of self-development journey. I haven't really thought about what I would do moving forward. I think I would. I feel blessed that I'm in a position where actually I have several months as a trainee. Um, you know, because again, that's another mind change shift that I've had. Because I was always in a rush, and I was like, I want to finish as quick as I can. You know, I was finding finding ways I could do that if I had to go up in percentage and things. But actually, you know, that it's all about perception. And I, I think now I'm in a position where I'm like, actually, 
I'm glad I'm not finishing in a month or two because, you know, I'd rather enjoy this time. Like, okay, you've done your exam. You're in a position where you can help your colleagues now. And I would really like to use this opportunity to, to do that and, and try, try to help other people get across the line as well from what I've learned um, and get through the portfolio and actually just develop my skills, everything I've learned in the last five, you know, in several months um, to apply that, continue applying that in day to day and actually get better and better. There's always room for improvement and and actually coming out, you know, when I, when I see CT, I can be in a position where actually I I genuinely think I'm, um, you know, I can do this as as an independent practitioner, and um, you know, I, I can be um, as good as anyone else. You know, um, I, I think moving forward, I probably would want a, a few months of a break after after ICCT, um, you know, and give back the time to family, kids, and things that I haven't been able to in all these months, um, you know, over the summer holidays. Uh, yeah. So I think I would. You know, I'm looking forward to to those those months where I wouldn't be working. Um, but yeah, but I know finding jobs nowadays is is um it's quite hard. So um, yeah, probably eventually get 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 on to finding finding one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you deserve a break at some point because you work so hard, <laughs> and and yeah. it's really good to see that um your your effort has paid off. And if you need any help with your career afterwards, please let mm -hmm. me know because I'd be more than happy to help you. Um, thank okay. you so much for sharing your insights today. And I'm sure yeah. that um, listening to what you've said is going to inspire many other GP trainees who are going through this journey right now. Um, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.